I'm Ellen Besner, and this is the CJN Daily, sponsored by Metropia. Well, Jewish Roots music is back in the spotlight this month in Ontario and in Quebec, with the two large annual Klezmer music festivals getting set to go ahead in person in a larger scale for the first time since COVID. Klez Canada is holding its in-person summer retreat August 22nd to 28th at Campanay Brith in Lantier, Quebec, while the Ashkenaz Festival starts August 30th and goes until September 5th at various downtown Toronto venues, especially Harbourfront. I'm out of the office for a few more days, so we're bringing you an encore of my interview last summer with Rachel Zucker, who hosts the Jewish Radio Hour in Winnipeg, and with the director of Klez Canada, Sebastian Schulman in Montreal, and Eric Stein, who directs the Ashkenaz Festival in Toronto. And we discuss the challenges of promoting Jewish roots music and culture during the pandemic. That's the sound of the traditional backwards march. It happens every August as part of the Klez Canada Festival. Klez Canada is one of the largest Jewish and Yiddish folk music festivals in North America, and the festival kicks off its 2021 retreat this Monday, August 23rd. It'll be online again due to COVID, as it was last summer, but they are planning for a couple of in-person events, live events, in Montreal. Meanwhile, Canada's other major Jewish music celebration, Toronto's Ashkenaz Festival, is going ahead this year. They also had to go mostly virtual again due to the pandemic, and COVID forced them to figure out new ways to reach their loyal fans. I mean, it's sort of ironic that you'll say that the pandemic is saving Yiddish. It's, it's really, un, you know, it's unfortunate that we're in a pandemic, de- but I guess perhaps with people having extra time on their hands, Yiddish is flourishing. Like everything else, Klez Canada and Ashkenaz were severely impacted by COVID. Both are in-person events with live performances. In the case of Klez Canada, the audience travels to a week-long summer retreat at the site of Campanay Brith, north of Montreal. And hundreds of Jewish culture lovers that take courses, they dance, and they hear concerts from some of the biggest names in Jewish world music who also traveled there to perform. For 25 years, Ashkenaz has brought Klezmer to the general public in Toronto, and it is a must-do end-of-summer event on the city's cultural scene. So with live music venues still under capacity restrictions and the Delta variant and the fourth wave happening, how are these two popular Jewish music festivals surviving? Coming up, we'll hear from the artistic director of Ashkenaz and the executive director of Klez Canada about what to expect this year and from the host of Winnipeg's Jewish Radio Hour, who feels that the pandemic may actually have saved Yiddish music. So whether you're a longtime attendee at Ashkenaz or Klez Canada, or you're someone who only knows a few Yiddish words, but we can't say any of them here on our show because they're swear words, you're going to want to meet my next guests. Joining me now to talk about how they marked their 25th edition and what's in store this year, here are Sebastian Schulman, the executive director of Klez Canada in Montreal, Eric Stein, the artistic director of the Ashkenaz Festival in Toronto, and from Winnipeg, Rochelle Zucker, who hosts the Jewish Radio Hour. Talk to us about how your 25-year anniversary um, celebrations had to pivot. You want to start with Eric, and then we'll go to Sebastian. Um, well, obviously, like everybody else, we had to adapt to the circumstances last year. It was supposed to be our 25th anniversary festival last, uh, last September. And um, instead of doing an in-person festival, what we did was a week of um, virtual concerts, virtual programming, where it was a pop-up concert once a day. Uh, paired with an archival concert once a day from, from the past of the festival. So that's what we did for our 25th anniversary. Well, we also did a, an online uh, exhibition that traced our history. So, so last year, similar to Ashkenaz, we adapted our program uh, for the online moment. Uh, and that meant for us taking uh, an intensely immersive and participatory kind of experience and putting that all uh, on Zoom and other platforms. So we had about a thousand people come from all over the world uh, to take different classes in klezmer music, Yiddish song, all kinds of aspects of Yiddish culture and Jewish history. 
uh, as well as pre-recorded concerts. Uh, and people came together. I mean, it was, it was really quite, quite exceptional. And I would think, you know, if I had to pick one uh, thing that really uh, distinguished our programming uh, in, in our first COVID year, uh, was that the feeling of community was really palpable. Even through the screen, people felt like they were together and they were experiencing something, they were building something, uh, something together. So, you know, it was very different than we anticipated our 25th anniversary being, but it still felt like, like it was uh, a real celebration. Rochelle, I want to bring you in to the conversation because um, as sort of the uh, an overview of how COVID had, has influenced Yiddish culture, uh, this last 18 months. As, as Sebastian has said, you get a chance to interact with people from all over the world. I know Yiddish classes themselves and Yiddish concerts online have been flourishing, but I, it's not the same. I know as a personal, from a personal observation, I've actually been, although I live in Winnipeg, I've been at every single Ashkenaz there has been. And it's much it's you know it's nice to see it all online but it's much nicer to be there to interact to actually see the people let's talk now about some of the programs you guys are about to offer but in terms of people who can come do you have to be into yiddish and know yiddish in order to enjoy this festival not at all uh i think that's kind of the essence of the work that we've done is that we're bringing this language and this culture to people that wouldn't otherwise seek it out or necessarily understand what it's about. Uh, but the music is universal and the sort of values that come across through it. I think um, if people don't seek it out to learn more about what it is, um, <clears throat> there are lots of stories of people who who have sort of gone down the Yiddish rabbit hole as a result of experiences like coming to the Ashkenaz Festival or going to Close Canada. I looked at some of the programming and some of the artists over the last few years, and it seems um, appropriate that we discuss the people who are not native Jewish or native Yiddish who actually are in this world. Um, there is, in general, controversy about cultural appropriation and who should be allowed to play cultural music if you're not of that culture. So how is that received? Is that an okay thing? Well, it's hard to really say. I know at, at first, myself, I was a little bit skeptical, but to me, it's really changed. It's not about who you are. It's that you're serious about it and that you're doing, doing it well. I know every so often, once or I, I only had it once, but I got an email from somebody. I had played a group from Germany and somebody sent me an email and said, you know, they support BDS. So I said, well, thank you for letting me know. But I think as people get more and more, it, and it's more than Yiddish, it's Jewish music. And that's one of the things I wanted want to say that from, from Ashkenaz and from especially, I've gotten a much deeper appreciation of not only Yiddish mu music, but Jewish music, which is a very, very vast field and before I came you know started going to Ashkenaz I thought you know Jewish music was Yiddish music or even Pripachik but just going to something like Ashkenaz and seeing that there's a lot of Sephardic music there's other types of music so it gives it really widens one's appreciation but I think you know I don't think I think it's the fact that people doesn't really matter who's doing it it's how they're doing it and that they're doing doing it well and they're contributing something one of the things that has become so well known in the last two years thanks to netflix is shtisel and the whole world of haredi and hasidic culture but the conversations doesn't seem to happen here between let's say westernized uh you know jews who do jewish music and roots and the Haredi community where they have their own singers and their own famous stars. Who are you not getting that should be part of this conversation? If I mean, I, th I feel like the, the interaction with contemporary Hasidic culture and the contemporary Hasidic community is, is a really rich place for, for all of us to grow. Um, so you see at Klez Canada's programming, uh, both in the summer and throughout the year, you will have not in large num numbers, but you do have Hasidic people uh, attend and there is a conversation um, there hasn't, you know, risen to the level of, of having Hasidic artists on our stages yet, but
but I feel like, you know, the, the boundaries are a lot more porous than they used to be. And if it's done with respect and care, I would love to see it grow uh, in our case to a, to a bigger artistic conversation as well. We're certainly open to it. And um, there's a few artists that have come across my radar who I've been interested in, in involving in the festival one way or another. Um, I think like one of the key things to really keep in mind in the, in the context of that question is just the contemporary Yiddish culture scene is so separate from the Hasidic world. They're completely different things. And, and in a way, the, the strength of the Yiddish culture scene, whatever it's been for the last 40 or so years, is based in the fact that it's secular <laughs> and that it's something that creates an alternative form of connection to Jewish identity and Jewish heritage. And I think a lot of the people that are involved in the music making and the culture making that goes on in our scene are coming to it for reasons that are actually diametrically opposed to the things that keep Hasidim speaking Yiddish as a vernacular language. Um, it's a really very, very complex kind of question and an interesting one. I want to bring Rochelle in on this. Uh, how should we understand that whole side of Yiddish and U Jewish music? And is that reflected in modern Yiddish festivals today? I don't know exactly it's the, whether the two will ever meet. I think in New York, they've tried it. They've had very success. Sebastian would know better, but successful concerts where like, Zalman Mulatik has organized concerts where he has brought some of the stars of the Hasidic world to the general stage, and they've been very well met. met. But I think it is a world that we should more discover more and more because there's some really interesting things some of the songs they wrote in that community for covid have been really eye-opening uh thank you all so much for being here on the cj and daily my pleasure a hard second bank <laughs> thank you and that's what jewish canada sounds like for this episode of the cj and daily sponsored by metropia integrity community quality and customer care and we'll close today's episode with this clip of Quest Canada's Seb Schulman, who explains the backstory of their famous backwards march. In the 20s, they would greet the Sabbath by marching backwards to synagogue and all singing the same niggin, the same tune. And uh, at Quest Canada, we've recreated this tradition uh, where we all march backwards up a hill, facing the setting sun, going into a lake, and everybody is singing and playing this one tune over and over again, and in sort of this incredible cacophony and unity, and everybody ends up at the top of the hill, singing and ready to eat, and uh, you put your instruments down, and Shabbos comes in, and whether or not you keep Shabbos, it is Shabbos and it is kind of incredible. And uh, it's not exactly the same online, but uh, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing even over the screen.